how's the uh, how's the day been going so far? Good, good. Yeah, it's my uh, my brother's going to college tomorrow, so just helping him kind of get ready to uh, pack up at down to Rutgers. Um, he's actually playing football there, so they're starting up training. Okay. And then um, nice. yeah. And, yeah, man. I'm taking a eight hour drive after that to go drop off my sister for um residency. So, wow. Yeah, yeah. A lot of moving parts, but it's all all good news. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. What um what what position did you rather play? Running back. Running yeah, back as well? Like yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. Okay, nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm guessing you had a head start with the with the whole raw recruiting, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he didn't he didn't need it. He he was um he's one of the top running backs in the state this past season so nice nice man yeah. yeah. um, he also, also played for senior hall uh so no so i he was a senior prep for a bit and then uh transferred to don bosco ah uh, got okay uh, yeah, yeah. nice that's nice. that's the powerhouse right there mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. nice awesome is this yeah. background annoying to you guys like is that light too shiny right there no when you when you're when yeah when you're facing the camera it's fine yeah okay. all right good good all right um yeah, so we'll just do uh, – I'm just going to do, like, a 3-2-1 countdown, and then, uh, yeah, I'll just do, like, a quick little intro, and then we'll just kind of start with uh, – yeah, probably just asking how you're doing and all about the, um, the quarantine and uh, I guess a little bit of, like, the George Floyd situation, if that's all right with you guys. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll just count this down. Sorry, I'm using a, my fucking laptop. It's broken. Right there. There's a monitor behind it. Right. Frank, I don't want to see your your crotch. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that. yeah, you know what it is? It's like the laptop is in front of me, and then there's a fucking TV monitor right behind it. So <laughs> Cause, cause my, something happened to my laptop where like it only shows the um, display when it's plugged into HDMI. I don't know what the hell's going on. I'm gonna get it fixed, but so I'm using okay. like a fucking TV monitor behind my laptop. So that's what's going on. But yeah, anyway, all right, yeah, I'll just do um, I'll just do like a three, two, one countdown, and I'll start it off. <laughs> all right. All right, three, two, one. Hey guys, this is Frank and Jules podcast, episode number eleven. Uh, we have a special guest on today. We have Kevin Menunga. He's a former uh, Cheaton Hall Prep running back, uh, former Villanova Wildcats running back, and he also had stints with the um, Eagles and Vikings in the NFL. And he was also uh, most recently uh, part of the Giants coaching staff as an assistant last year. Um, we're really honored and privileged to have Kevin on today, man. And I just want to thank you for um, taking the time out to join us today. No, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. So yeah, how, how's um, quarantine been treating you? Because we, we always talk about this because it's just like, obviously no one's ever been through this. Uh, so we're just trying to adjust and, and figure out like what we can do to either keep busy or just stay like mentally strong. Cause it's just been, like something you can't even make up. So I just wanted to see like, yeah. how, you, how you've been dealing with it uh, since it's been going on. It was definitely an adjustment. Um, at first, you know, just, and I think once I found a routine, um, kind of helped my mind kind of operate. I think football's kind of trained me to operate on a schedule. So um, I had to kind of create my own schedule. And, you know, I think that kind of helped the transition. Yeah, gosh, gotcha, for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, man. So like um, <clears throat> from the, like when, when did you, when did you start to realize like you want like when did you start playing football? Uh, so I started in, in it's actually kind of late, relatively speaking. In sixth grade was when I first played organized uh, football. Um, I was on during a recess, probably I don't know third fourth grade when we started playing, and I was like, oh, I kind of like this, but like it's just tagged, you know, because we're at school and stuff. But yeah. um, but I was like, you know, felt that. I, I was fast and all that. So I was chubby for a little bit when I was like in first grade. <laughs> and then, and then uh, you know, I guess I changed over the course of the summer just running around outside. Uh, kids were more active back then. And uh, um, yeah, man, then I first saw an NFL game on TV around the same time I started playing. I was like, wow, that'd be kind of cool like to do that. And, yeah. um, you know, the passion for the game. Luckily, I think the one thing that helped is my parents never pushed it on me. You know, um, I had a lot of friends who, like, they're, when they were born, their dad decided they were going to be a football player, whereas my parents never – sports was not important. It was school that they kept uh, pushing on me. So I, I think it was kind of my outlet from, you know, schoolwork. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it was like my escape. But, um, yeah, man, you know, so probably about 10, 
10 to 12 was when like the passion to kind of pursue this thing to its uh, fullest extent took hold, I guess. Gotcha. gotcha. That's, pretty, yeah. that's pretty awesome. Where did you, um, before Seton Hall, where did you uh, play? Like, did you go to, was it like in a middle school or something like that? Yeah, West Sussex Cowboys. It's, uh, oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. The rival of the uh, Caldwell Chiefs. Yeah, <laughs> the <sir>. classic <laughs> alma mater or whatever. Not even fucking whatever, some middle school. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 didn't, I never made it to um, middle school. I played only like fourth and fifth grades. I was just like, I don't know what happened. I, and then, and then I had like in high school, I had some stint where like I, I came in, I had some like ridiculous idea that I was going to be like, I, I, I wanted to play quarterback. <laughs> <I never played. laughs> I came into practice and like, um, it was after like I played a year of soccer and the coach was like, uh, we're like, we're actually like, so you played soccer, like you want to be a kicker? I was like, <laughs> actually like no, right. because they didn't realize like I was a guy on the team that like. I was like towing the ball. Like I was a freshman in high school. I was like towing the ball. Like I, I could not shoot the rest of my life. Yeah. My friend actually was already the kicker. He thought I was trying to like come in and steal his spot. I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> like, yeah, I completely wrong. He's like, I want to be the quarterback, man. And he's like, and like, it just, and I ended up being there for like maybe um, just like preseason, like just practicing. And then I ended mm-hmm. up like just being like, you know what? I kind of want to go. I, I like basketball. That's my first love. So I was like, let me just go back to that. That's um, it, bro. That's what it's about. I remember I had to tell the coach, like, you know what? Uh, he's like, I don't think I'm ready, man. <laughs> he's like, he's like, no one's ready. Like, it's August. And I was like, I, I just can't, I can't do it. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> so I moved on from there. But, um, yeah, no, that's a funny uh, – just a funny memory of mine. But, yeah, when you um, – so did you get, like, approached by, uh, like, the head coach of Seton Hall, like, when you were in middle school to, like, come play for them? No, nah, man, actually, uh, the Seattle prep thing kind of happened, um, by, not, I wouldn't say by accident, but uh, I was like, you know, typical class clown, unfocused, girl chasing eighth grader. So, <laughs> you know, my, <laughs> yeah. parents, <laughs> my, parents, my parents pretty much told me, like, either you go to all boys Catholic school or you're going to go live with your grandfather in Africa until you're 18. So I was like, all right, I guess I'm going, guess I'm going to see an all prep. So, um, yeah, that could be, yeah, man, my parents were not playing. And, um, you know, but it, it ended up being one of the best decisions I made, you know, I made and kind of laid the foundation for the man that I ended up becoming. So, yeah. so it's, it's, it's crazy that, um, I mean, if, if I have this correct, I know your parents were from Cameroon, correct? Yep. And they like immigrated when they were teenagers. Um, mm-hmm. So, but you're, you're, you and your, your siblings are born here and yeah. it, it's kind of crazy because like, I'm also from like an immigrant mom, you know, my mom mm-hmm. is from the Caribbean, um, awesome. came here and, you know, lived in New York and, and, and try to kind of build a life for us and me and my brothers. Um, mm-hmm. The, the thing was like the, the story about you where they gave you the ultimatum about like either going to live with your, with your grandfather in Cameroon or staying mm-hmm. here. My mom actually, I don't know if you know most about Caribbean parents, but like they might send their kids back to the Caribbean to like live there. Yeah. yeah. Well, I lived there from when I was four until I was 12. And I came back here for like, um, for middle school and whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And once I got to high school, I was like, oh, I started to like, like football because I started to play Madden, blah, blah, blah. So I went out for practice. Um, so I know you're from this area. I'm from Montclair. So it's like. Okay. A- <laughs> I used to live in Montclair before we lived where we live now. Oh, did you? Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's his county boys, man. There you go. Yeah. Call yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, so when I went, I went out to try for football practice, and I was going out for wide receiver, and um, you probably know the guy, um, Drew Jenkins. So mm. <laughs> Drew gave me a hit, and I, when I tell you, I saw stars, and I think I was on the ground for five minutes. I was like, yeah, it's not for me. Contact is yeah. not for me. Not <laughs> <terrible>. <laughs> But um, I do love to watch the game. And, um, I actually do think I know Drew. He, he played lax yeah. at, uh, at Syracuse. Yeah, yeah. His, uh, his sister's Kayla. And all. I, I'm friends with Yeah. yeah. There small you go. World. It's crazy. Small, small world. Mm-hmm. But um, no, man, I, I think contact, it, it's, you started at a younger age and, and stuff like that. And I feel like, I don't know, man, the, the fact that your parents, one, didn't force it on you, but they were – okay with you kind of playing football that's like the um oh they were forced to make me play because my friends saw how good i was and then their parents were like no he needs to do this so they didn't want me to uh, play football they thought it was too violent and then true. now my mom watches nfl network more than i do so it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Full circle. 
Yeah. So wow. it's funny how that that kind of flipped, but yeah. That's that's crazy. But so so right there, you actually just so you mentioned the the, the violence of the sport, and I guess just a, a quick segue into kind of what's happening um, right now in, in society, like mm-hmm. as as a, as a black man in this country who, you know, went to a, a prestigious college, um, not only for football, but also for a great, a great education. Cause I know a lot of kids from Villanova, which we called it Villanova fun, but, uh, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> <Probably so>. <laughs> <laughs> how do you, I think my question that I really want to ask you was, um, do you, do you think that, um, the, the black people in America in terms of like from whether they're from, from Africa or, you know, blacks from the Caribbean or black or American blacks. Like, do you find it that it's been harder for us to kind of come together as, as one and, and, and kind of fight for the same cause. Right. Cause I do know that African blacks might be like, Hey man, like are my kids, like we're doing this education, Caribbean, same thing, but it's like, they, they, there's been a conflict with if you were born, if you were truly from America and you're an American black quote unquote. And mm-hmm. like, there's been like that stigma of like, we are all different. And so have you, yeah. have you noticed that? Yeah, unfortunately. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing, it stems from infighting, you know, divide and conquer type of deal. Um, I, I was raised, you know, my, my, as a joke in our family, if my mom was born here, she would have, you know, been Angela Davis's best friend, you know, so it's like, <laughs> and I was raised in a house where it, you were told, it was very clear that as African immigrants, you, we're essentially reaping the benefits of the civil rights movement and the people that went through the struggle and are continuing to go through the struggle. Like, yes, when other people look at us as black people, they don't be they're not like, oh, he's Jamaican, he's Cameroonian, he's black American, and we're all black, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's um that's how we should approach it. But we have we have work to do there. There's baggage behind that. You know, there are Africans who look at black Americans you know, believe what the media would portray them to uh, to be, and that there were Black Americans that look at Africans as dirty, and you know, it's like so. It's it's like you know, there has to come a time where it's very clear that all that stuff is just narratives we've either been told or have internalized, or whatever the case may be. But at the end of the day, we are all the same people. So you know, that's um, I think when we start to realize that and act accordingly, that'll. Um, solve a lot of the issues we have in-house and then we can, you know, present a united front to attack the problems that we have externally. Agreed. Agreed. So what do you, what do you feel about the, um, like, you know, the whole, like, kind of like George Floyd situation, like what did you and your family, what was like the, you know, the thoughts kind of going through your mind essentially? Yeah, man, it's sad. Um, it's, uh, you kind of have, as a as a black person in America, you either you almost have to compartmentalize your pain, and I think with other deaths, it's been easier to do that. But with this, it was so in your face, and you know, like we're in an unprecedented time, like you were saying, Frank. You know, just for quarantine and all that. You know, no one, there's no drill for this. No one's ever been in a time like this. Yeah. So I think there was nothing. You were forced to look at it. There was nothing to really compartmentalize. Even if you have work, like you're still at home on your phone, like it's everywhere you're, you you look on the internet, you know. So I think it forced people to really take a long, hard, uncomfortable look in the mirror. And um, I think it's necessary, though. You know, I, I've I've heard the death categorized or George Floyd categorized as a martyr, but I, I think more than anything, he's a cat. It was a catalyst for long due. Um, you know, changes, I guess you could say. Um, but, you know, you just hope that those changes, human beings were stubborn, but so unfortunately it takes bloodshed for things to really start moving, you know, so. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's yeah. true. It's, um, no, it's, it, I, I think it's like to your point, you know, the, the, like I wouldn't say yes, he's a martyr. And I think it, it like you, to your point, you know, him being a catalyst. And I think, immediately you know the media automatically kind of went to the negatives right they automatically kind of use his past against him right exactly when, when in the, within this country it's all about opportunities right it's all about like mm-hmm. what do you do with your second chances right mm-hmm. so then stems from the fact that like if you prison's supposed to be this place where or, or whatever like you go you get reformed you get re- rehabilitated you pay your crime and you come mm-hmm. back to society a better person 
right. from his charges that, that happened in 2007, he comes back and, you know, moves his family to Minneapolis want, and, and wants to do better for himself and, and right. be a better citizen, which is what you would hope anyone would do, right? So mm-hmm. from, from that standpoint, a man who's trying to be better, the media then kind of harps on the fact that, okay, yes, he did this thing in the past, but then you look at our president and you realize like, look, man, this guy told this day is still doing things that are, you know what I mean? Suspect, Suspect. at best, yeah. <laughs> exactly, right? So it's, it's hard to believe being an American citizen and being black and being that like, this is what the flag represents. Like my brother was in the army, right? And he was now born here. He was a Jamaican, he's a Jamaican um, and he became a citizen and joined the army, you know, went to Afghanistan, did all that stuff, right? Became, mm-hmm. like, went to NGIT, became an engineer, like all that stuff. But at the end of the day, like if he gets, like he told me the other day about the story about his son where um, this white lady had a dog, the dog bit him. Um, my, my, my nephew is like 17, so he doesn't really care. He's like, whatever, I got bit, whatever. He didn't even want to go to the hospital. He still wanted to go to work. And then long story short is his mom, my sister-in-law came out, um, found the woman, the woman offered to pay X amount of money for whatever, whatever. So we took mm-hmm. that. And then the cops came. The cops came into my brother's home and basically said, oh, kind of put him in light. Like, so what did you, why did the dog bite you? Like, what, what did you do to put yourself in that situation? And then he also then mentioned like, well, at least you weren't trying to break into her house. Right? Literally, that exact same terminology into a house that my brother built. But, so it, it's, it, I think it, it's incumbent that like, it's it's tough to be black in this country, but at the same time, like we as a country, like to your point, we need to come together and find a way to be more united because that's the only way like any of this theoretically can change is if is if we come as a as a unit and not just mm-hmm. singular forms. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's crazy, man. Um, like even when uh, Colin Kaepernick started kneeling. Uh, in 2016 like I was kind of I was always just pissed off at people that were angry at him because I was just like bro it's just first of all he changed it so I, I guess somebody at one point sat down on a bench I don't know which player sat down and then they changed mm-hmm. it to kneeling to make it more respectful mm-hmm. or whoever that complained I think it was like military or something so well, well Frank I, just, just, yeah. just a quick on your point yeah. so Colin Colin was was sitting on the bench and then a former military it leader, was him oh, okay yeah literally wrote him a letter saying, Hey, like, can we, can we talk more about the dialogue on this? So they met. Right. And then they, he, he, he came up, he's like, Hey, like, this is based on what I've seen. Like, I, I understand. I, I want to come from your perspective. So he then said, Hey, like, I think kneeling might be a better way to silently protest this from a military standpoint. But I just want to mm-hmm. kind of just say mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was just annoyed because I would hear people like, um, say stuff like my dad's like not watching it anymore i was like what are you fucking, like are you fucking kidding me bro it's like why, why like what does that have anything to do why does that make you so upset like i don't understand it's like yeah like bill burr even had a joke about it and especially he's like it's my favorite uh, my favorite you know, comedians right? yeah and he's like he's like my brother died 9 11 he watched my, he's like my yeah. uh my brother was like a firefighter he watched 9 11 on television or something i was like yeah like, Sorry. <laughs> like, no, no one, one said saying, anything <laughs> yeah, it's like we're not talking about that. It's like, I don't know, it just drove me nuts because I'm like, bro, like your dad's a fucking idiot if he's not watching because of this. Like, it's like, bro, like your fucking sad. day, like this this ruined your day. Like you fucking had like, it's like, oh yeah, we had a great, t- we had a great Sunday with a barbecue, but then I couldn't watch football because somehow I was kneeling for the anthem. Like, what? There, there are I, many people who have long benefited from the status quo and any disruption or pointing out of how the status quo doesn't serve a group of other people, it makes people uncomfortable. So they grab onto any thing that they can, i.e. the flag, and yeah. the perceived disrespect of the flag, when in reality, what we're really trying to address is police brutality. So yeah. that's just what it comes down to, is just, you know, and people are going to do what the people are going to do, bro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. It's- so, how did you how did you take what the NFL kind of quote unquote said now, you know, coming out and saying, well, you know, like we should have listened, blah, 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 but they didn't mention Colin Kaepernick. They didn't do all of that. So what did you, did you take that as like, uh, okay, the NFL might be coming around or do you just think it was just kind of like a, a quick PR stunt? Um, that's a matter of, 
I uh, I plan on having the NFL the National Football League as a future employer. So I'll just say that um, oh, yeah. they, <laughs> yeah. they, they, that they're doing what is in their best interest, and you know, taking it into account the uh, the change that is coming in our cultural, uh, I guess, time. Or yeah. uh, so, better question is: Did you did you did you like the the um, the video that some of the top players kind of oh, presented? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. for sure. I mean, I, you know, the, it is a player's league and um, they have more power than they realize. Well, they're starting to realize, you know, I think the NBA just by the, the, the nature of it's how it's set up mm-hmm. kind of empowers players a little bit more than the NFL does because um, there are fewer of them. So, you know, their voices are a little louder. Uh, but I, I think it was really awesome to see a lot of the top players come in and, you know, taking a stand in that way. Okay. No, I, I definitely agree. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it's tough because, you know, I think we, we all love sports. I love watching sports, and I feel like it is going to be a great way, a great medium to still kind of, you know, I think sports has always been a thing that, that's that's used to fight injustice, right, since, the very, since like segregation, right? So where mm-hmm. a lot of the players predominantly were going to black colleges, and one segregation kind of happened um, or, 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 or was kind of, Ball like um, removed essentially, like they realize okay, we need to kind of get more black athletes into our programs, blah blah, blah right? So, mm-hmm. rightfully so, your Villanovas, your Dukes, like all these blue blood schools theoretically have profited, right? In, 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 in good as well, because it's also helped our community, right? Help, right? Help educate. Exposure, yeah, I mean. exactly. So, I can't. There, there's a symbiotic relationship, but I think there's a point where like the Texas um, head coach kind of said it best where basically we, we will cheer for you basically for three hours on a Saturday, right? We will do that. We'll, we, we will be happy when you score a touchdown, but will you then hire these individuals in your companies, right? Will you mm-hmm. then vouch for them kind of going forward? And I think that's, I think this situation has now made it, made people realize like wow like the when whenever someone says about um how do we like um how do you put it like can we be more how do we become more diverse right does it mean like oh we need to hire this black person or this brown person or whatever i think diversity is, is, is um is more of a an idea of like when you truly ask yourself when you take a, a holistic view of your company or, or you, mm-hmm. you ask yourself like what are we truly doing to be different, to make sure we are truly inclusive, right? And that's not right. just about color. It's also about the ideas of, 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 of who you're hiring. And sometimes that brown person, theoretically, the on paper may not have everything, but as a team, you need different members of a team because they might elevate, elevate your team. You can't have everyone on, your, everyone on your team cannot be Michael Jordan, right? So, mm. but Michael Jordan, that grit that he had, that competitive nature to – do certain things which a player who was not on his level couldn't do. Um, you need that, so you need to understand the dynamic of a team and, and realize how that relationship could elevate. Some people are just really good at elevating others and getting you to be the best at your ability. And I think we need to truly look at that. And that's going to be the whole thing about how we can kind of continue the, the you know the question about being diverse and and, and things of that nature. So, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. Um- I was actually going to ask you, Kevin, because that kind of reminded me when you talked about college sports a little bit, how obviously they're starting to now implement a system, or I guess it's going to be maybe put in place like next year where um, athletes can profit off their likeness. They can, uh, I guess they can have like their, they can promote their businesses yeah. by using their likeness or whatever. But I think there was some specific rule about it. I guess you couldn't, uh, you can't use the school as part of that, but it, whatever, that's another topic for another day. But I just wanted to see, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to see like what you thought about that, if you can answer it without getting in trouble. And then also yeah. uh, the other one was, um, oh, man, I just, oh my God, I just dropped it. Um, yeah, sorry. The other one was about how like your recruiting process was, if you want to take that one first about how, like, because you said that you had some, or I read somewhere, I think that you had, the reason you started to run recruit was because you, like your process of getting recruited wasn't mm-hmm. um, you, you thought it could have been better if you wanted, if you yeah. wanted, if you could speak on that. Yeah, man. I mean, so in terms of players being able to uh, monetize their, their image, 
name and likeness. I think that's awesome. It's long overdue. Um, yeah, I saw something Reggie Bush said um, that there should be some caution with that, you know, because some kids would, might end up messing themselves up, you know, but although they should still have the ability to make money because not everyone's going to make it to the NFL. And if, you know, a hundred grand you make before your college season or college career is over, that may be a, a really good head start on life, you know, for a lot of people. So um, I think that it's all, it's all heading in the right direction. Yeah. Um, actually, you know, I, I got in trouble for something similar to that. I'll, I'll get into that later, but to answer, <laughs> your, <laughs> to answer your next question. Um, yeah, man, I, so I was um, probably I was le- I was the leading running back in New Jersey in 2000 or 2010 2010 season no 2009 season my junior year um, and you know junior year is your biggest year in recruiting and I was um, I was getting talked to by you know pretty much most of the big colleges on the Eastern Coast like uh, Rutgers BC uh, Maryland at the time you know. Um, all on the verge of about to offer me a full scholarship. It was about sixth, seventh game into the year. Um, I suffered a third degree high ankle sprain. And, um, excuse me, you know, pretty much all, every school that was talking to me dropped me, you know, with an attorney phone calls, you know, that type of deal. So I went into my senior year with no offers and then ended up um, having probably one of the most uh, record breaking single season performances in Essex County history. Um, Broke every record, rushing record at CNL preps and CNL preps 150 plus year history. Um, I think my total, my stat line was like 2,266 yards, 35 touchdowns, like something. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I ended up, you know, Villanova came literally, I got offered by Nova three weeks before signing day, committed the next week. Um, My only D1 offer ended up being Central Michigan. Um, And then I had a couple other sprinkled ones in there like Towson, uh, New, uh, Towson, Maine. I pretty much see all the other CA schools like in D1 AA uh, afford them. But it was uh, it very, I mean, my parents didn't know how to get me recruited because, you know, this is the, from the firstborn. They, yeah. you know, didn't grow up here, didn't really have any uh, notion as to how to do that, you know, and um, we were paying recruiting services like more money than they should have been getting paid for no results, really, you know, all this exposure they talk about. Um, and there was no real uh, tangible results that we were getting for the money that we were paying. So I knew just from that experience that there was a lot left to be done in that space. And, um, you know, raw recruit essentially is a way for athletes to be empowered with the information that they need and, um, you know, kind of go about that in a way that empowers them, you know, so they can put their email, put their height, weight, how, uh, you know, pretty much like any of their campus life preferences. So like how many girls want to go to school with, how many, you know, black kids, like whatever the case may be. Right. Um, And then also obviously search from the academic and athletic standpoint, and then it gives them a list of schools that fit their criteria. Then they can call and email every coach on staff at the school straight from their phone. So it's just a way to kind of, um, streamline the the means of communication between athletes and uh college coaches wow gotcha man Ooh. yeah is that is that done through like um <clears throat> is it mostly based on like the the like the the athletes like taking that control or does their like their high school like their coaches would kind of like have like okay i have like x amount of these guys that i think can kind of go d1 whatever so they would sign up from a school perspective with that as well? Uh, so I, I can offer, I offer uh, packages. So if I were to approach a head coach at a high school, I'd be like, all right, I can sell you X amount of accounts in a group deal, but it is tailored towards individuals kind of downloading the app and, you know, doing it themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of people, it's a little bit of education in that a lot of people are used to just depending on their high school coaches, whereas no one's going to be a bigger advocate for yourself than yourself. So this is all about, um, you know, proactive, autonomous um, control over your recruiting cycle or recruiting journey, I should say. Gotcha. No, I, I, yeah, man. I definitely agree. I think, I, I mean, I checked out the app and just kind of, it looks very clean. I mean, and thank you. R- ratings on, on, um, on uh, the Apple, like the, 
the, the app itself is like really good. So I think you, you, you clearly, you understand that like kids are all into social media, right. And everything is, is through applications now. So I think you can kind of get into that medium. That would be very cool as well. But I noticed that you have about, I think as, as of the moment, there's about what, 550 colleges that you yep. have so yeah. far. Yeah, 580 in total, so about 5,800 coaches on the database. Wow, nice. that's, yeah. that's, that's a big kind of database for a lot of kids to kind of use. Like, yeah. is, is the goal to be, like, you, you, like, is your goal, long-term goal, hopefully to kind of make, make this even maybe universal, or is it going to be, yes. like, there to be bigger than just, like, say, football, essentially? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm really testing this out. It's something that my dad and I did together, so, you know, literally – I put together the, the information. My dad's been in cybersecurity for about 30 years, so it's, mm-hmm. um, couldn't have had a more perfect partner, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so he took the data, locked it down, and we outsourced the development to a tech firm in India. Nice. And, um, you know, essentially, I'm just testing it out, really. So, like, I initially started it with $150 a year annual subscription, brought that down to $50, and now I'm going to start toying around with, um, you know, a $5 monthly situation Mm -hmm. because i mean in reality if they're getting unlimited access to those coaches you can really get the information that you need within a month or two and i think five dollars people are going to not blink at that versus paying fifty dollars up front and maybe only using it for a month whereas the month-to-month uh recurring model um you know if you do that and you get a hundred thousand kids that's even if you only use it for one two months it's still pretty good, good uh, chunk of change right there so yeah i mean and you even said it yourself like you said your june like the junior years for 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 um high school students or it's like it's like your biggest recruiting year right so mm-hmm. Absolutely. You, might, you might notice okay well you know this guy going to his from a sophomore year into his junior year like these coaches real or, or the the athletes realize like hey let me try to use it now and and for that that time span essentially so no that's i think that's a very good that's a very good model that's that's pretty Thank cool you. Uh, yeah, like, and then I'll definitely once I prove out. All right, let's say the five dollar a month model works. Then I'll uh, start branching out to other sports. Wow, that's that's a that's a that's a good goal. And um, no, I think that's. I think. Do you think you would have? You probably. I think you needed the experience of being an athlete, being an academic, being um, or not having your family truly understand the, rec- the recruiting process to, to come up with this idea right 100 percent, 100 percent. man it was um it's crazy my dad actually was the one who suggested it to me he was watching shark tank and there was uh <laughs> <laughs> there was there was a, a product similar but they they are operate from a purely at uh, academic scholarship uh, perspective my dad was like oh you could easily do something like this with uh with sports i was like yeah you know and then i kind of started to flesh out the idea um, during my rookie season in the league, and yeah, and here we are. Wow, that's, yeah, that's crazy, man. So how um, so like right now, uh, like if you had to like kind of like um, put the amount of time you have to spend on that, and like also for, like also trying to get back into the league as like uh, I assume you're going back into you're trying to get back into the coaching area. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess like I was gonna ask like how much of your like time like how do you um do you have like a, a number of employees that are at raw recruit or like, do you have to do like do a lot of the work yourself while you're trying to also get back to um, the NFL? Yeah. So a lot of the work, I mean, recruiting because of quarantine was kind of on a dead stop. Uh, so mm-hmm. I kind of pivoted away from that. I'm actually about a week away for in the next week, I'll be done with uh, the certification and project management. So in terms of a day job, I'll be doing project management for a bit until coaching kind of opens back up. I was actually trying to follow Coach Shermer out to Denver to coach the Broncos. Um, yeah. But, you know, we'll see what, how that goes. He's an offense coordinator now versus a head coach, obviously. So um, there's less leeway in terms of how quickly you can bring me over if that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at college, too. Um, I have a really close relationship with the head coach at Villanova. So there's a possibility from, from, for some things over there. Um, cool. Yeah, man. So I'm, I, in terms of coaching, it's right time, right place. Or right place, right time, I should say. So um, while I'm waiting for that time to come, I'm kind of uh, pivoting. But a raw recruit, I, I mostly use contractors. So it's like I don't have any employees that uh, work full time. Like as I need jobs done, I'll, I'll hire somebody and you know kind of get it done like that. But 
um, as we're starting to reopen and colleges, especially like my brother going down to college soon, like recruiting is going to come back at some point or another. So um, that'll kind of be, I'm, I'm using this downtime to actually, um, I'm going to start learning how to code a bit so I can do less of the contract and, you know, some of the work myself. Mm. And it's just, a, it's a good skill to have, I think, uh, going yeah. forward as the world becomes more tech driven, you know. I, I, I see that you, from based on what you're, you're telling me right now, you're, you're trying to create like this, for lack of a better term, a nice monopoly for yourself, right? Because if you think about it, like, <laughs> like you're trying to build a recruiting platform so you can track the high school, you can track and, and get a pull for, from, your, from your high school, then to college. So once you're in the league as a coach, like you, you can just be like, look, man, I already got the platform. Like I got the database, like Absolutely. everything's right here, bro. So we, yeah, can, man. we can get the, we can scout the best guys with their, with their scouts. And so you're, you're literally going in with your own business and your own scout team automatically. Like that's a, that's a yeah. lot. Yeah. So, I mean, I will say this though. So the people who need this app are not going to be your blue chip uh, scout uh, prospects, I should say. Mm-hmm. You know, those guys probably knew they were going to Ohio State when they were in eighth grade. You know, these are for the vast majority of kids that may have, you know, there's a school like Miss Accordia University, which is a Division three school that I didn't even know about until I made the app. But there may be a kid out there who's thinking he's going to Villanova or wherever, but Miss Accordia is a perfect match for him. That's who this app is for. It's to connect kids with schools, coaches, and programs that they would have never had an idea was a good match for them and allowed them the uh, the platform with which to communicate to the, with these coaches. Okay. So it's, it's really a connector, but it's for the vast majority. I, I wouldn't say, I mean, I may be surprised, you know, kids end up developing crazily, but most of these kids probably won't make it to the NFL. So yeah. um, with that being said, there, it's no reason why they shouldn't have an opportunity to pursue football at the collegiate level, get a great education and, you know, maybe even get some money to help pay for that cost. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what do you think about, um, I guess this upcoming NFL season, do you think that like they're going to maybe play games without fans or have you heard anything that they're trying to like, adjust when like the season comes around because i'm wondering i mean like i could see it i guess i could see it going on without fans but it's mm-hmm. hard to imagine like even the nba it's hard to imagine like i'm a huge basketball fan but like i also could see like myself watching it and not being as excited because it's almost like if they're just like in an empty gym like I'm, i'll be watching yeah. it but like it's kind of gonna be it's gonna be a little bit weird if it's like yeah, absolutely there's no like crowd passion there's no excitement or anything like that mm-hmm yeah, no, I think uh, I think the NBA is gonna be is gonna be like the test tube, baby. I guess. Um, yeah. You know, kind of seeing how that goes. You know, we obviously had the UFC fight. What was that a week or two ago? With uh, oh yeah, I forgot. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's 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 being tested out, but I, it will definitely be different if that is the route we go. Yeah, I I, I don't, my only thing is just like unlike a lot of the the other sports like it's just the volume of players like you need right i mean each each team has their 53 man roster and they might mm-hmm. even have more now right because guys might get sick and they need to like be able to have a, a pool mm-hmm. they can pull from right so mm-hmm. 53 players on each team and you have like how many coaches are on are usually on one staff on the giant staff we had about 23 24 on 23. both sides so all three sides of the ball yeah so you have 24 plus coaches 53 plus players plus medical staff so even without fans alone like you're gonna have a couple hundred people just within like oh yeah you know so it's it's a it's i think to your point it is going to be that's probably going to be the truest test of a team sport and how they can kind of do it and i don't know man i'm i'm excited but at the same time i'm also scared because like you you just i don't know how how it truly is going to play out you know i mean i think this this is going to (laughs) be A definitely like a scary kind of because if, if the nfl do, does it and god forbid something happens and then you know other you know major league sports gets kind of like okay well this didn't work out so like we might mm-hmm. have to push this back so yeah i, I do hope it, it kind of works and, and um and everything kind of goes as planned essentially mm-hmm. definitely yeah but um when when you when you want your rookie season essentially in the nfl um, you're, you're, you're leaving Villanova. Like, when did you think like you, th- one, you, th- you, you could play in the NFL 
And then from there, once you got there, like how was like that first season for you? Um, I mean, you definitely have your doubts up until the moment you're putting your cleats on for the first practice. <laughs> you know? um, but you just trust your training, man. I, you know, I worked very hard um, in preparation. Um, you know, there's definitely moments of during practice that first week where I was kind of pinching myself like, yo, like, did I just do that? Like, <laughs> yeah. literally, like you know, Fletcher Cox was right next to me. Just you know, just, yeah. he used to make fun of me all the time, bro. That guy, he's not, <laughs> uh, that's, that's that's my dog, bro. Um, but yeah, man, it's just it, it was it was a surreal feeling, you know. But you definitely settle into it and um, kind of have to remind yourself, like, oh, I'm, you can't. While respecting your peers, you have to also believe that you're there for a reason and there's uh, no reason that you should look at the next man as any better than you, you know, but there has to be a humility that comes with that for sure. Cause you know, you got to earn your stripes all over again, just like every level that you go to, you know, whether it's Pee Wee to high school, high school to college and, you know, not college to the NFL. Okay. Yeah. How, how did it feel getting like hit by like a three? Did you ever get like hit by a 300 pound one? <laughs> like, I feel uh, like I like, does that ever happen? Yeah, <laughs> honestly, it's it's weird, bro. Like, the um, the physical side wasn't the biggest jump for me. It was the mental, like how fast the game is and how much more information you have to process all at once, you know. Um, but no, I never got like, – I got I got hit one time where I got caught off guard. I was like, damn, I kind of hurt. Like, you can't act like it. But, but no, nah, it was cool, though. It was cool. Yeah, I never – you know, knocked on wood. Actually, I broke my shoulder when we played the Packers my rookie year. Um, but you know, luckily nothing happened. I got, I, I've been tackled and fallen new like hundreds, if not thousands, of times. But for some reason, I kept my arm open as I hit the ground, and like dudes' weight and my weight all went on my open like shoulder blade or something. It was crazy. Oof. Yeah, but you know, luckily nothing, uh, nothing broke. So. <laughs> I mean, and arguably, I mean, you you played like the uh, probably the most violent position, second to I guess like offensive lineman, right? But mm-hmm. like, did you like was that ever was that ever scary to you? Like, was that like did you think like man, I could probably play like a slot receiver, or something like a little less like violent, or are you just like you know, man, this is I'm good at this position, like I've, I've built this craft here. Like, no coaches ever tried to like change you and say hey man like let's, let's put you in the slot blah blah like stuff like that um i think the position is now gone especially with the game to where a slot being having the ability to be in the slot is only a value add to you as a back mm-hmm. um but you know man i mean I, I think the moment the only time i ever got hurt was when i thought to myself about getting hurt so it's like you have the mm. fearless the, there's a fearlessness that you, you have to play the game with and if you don't that's literally the beginning of the end for you. So that yeah. that, that I agree. I mean, yeah. to that to that notion, what do you think the Christian McCaffrey contract is going to have on like the psyche of running backs now? And like, obviously, the high. I mean, if more guys are getting top dollars, like that's going to help all of the positions. But like, for sure, what, what did you think of that? Like, what do you think the running back community was like? All right, like Christian did that. Like. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I think everyone started. Uh, I think most guys went and bought a jug machine and started working on the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Nah, he, he deserves every penny, bro. That dude is he's elite. So he really is. He, he really honestly is. could go on most rosters and be your number three receiver. Like, no joke. Yeah. But do you do you think that? Um... So he, so yes, it, it required him to be a phenomenal, you know, out the back people kind of, you know, receiver or like, mm-hmm. you know, your team's third best receiver kind of thing. Like it also means that like, it, there's also going to be more wear and tear on the body. Right. So mm-hmm. as, as a back in general, where based on just everything that's kind of going on, like the, the, the position has become theoretically devalued, but um, how do you, if you're if you're a coach and, and a running back is like all right man i need to work on my, my, my passing ability at the same time but at the same time like you know you know your carries are also going to go up as well so what do you what would you tell a young running back who one understands that the game is changing um mm-hmm. but at the same time like you're all you're also probably going to have to be doing more carries and, and touches of that ball like how do you then tell them to kind of prepare mentally physically because 
that is going to, you're going to be required to do that in order to even be considered great essentially. In this league. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's comes down to training, man. You, um, my rookie year, uh, Chip Kelly was my head coach, and we had a, uh, a Navy SEAL. <laughs> yeah, I lot. I I people can say what they want about Chip, bro. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's we had a Navy SEAL come and uh, speak to us, and he was talking about um, essentially you always fall to the lowest, so you fall to the lowest level of your training, right? So like, no matter how much you prepare. When fatigue hits, it's just a human reaction. You're gonna your performance is gonna fall. But if you've trained up to a certain level, that performance drop off will only be so low, right? So, well, as long as you put in the work and you know, in terms of increased capacity, that's just gonna require you to increase your capacity in your training, but then also increase the capacity of your recovery. You know, the things you're doing off the field, whether that's your mobility work, different things like that, to make sure that your body can handle that load. You know, I always looked at uh, the off-season training time as, like, I was really big into, like, Dragon Ball Z and stuff like that. So, like, <laughs> it literally be, like, you know, training for, um, you know, some battle with, like, you know, Freezer or something like that. I know it's, like, weird, but at the same time, um, yeah, man, it's just, like, you literally are weight training to build up your body to the point where it can handle that you know, over the course of now 17, maybe 18 games if, uh, if the NFL is its way. But, yeah. I hope you, hopefully you had the hyperbolic chamber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah so, no, I think it's, it's possible, though. It's definitely possible. You just got to you gotta embrace the suck and, you know, realize it's all for uh, the glory in the fall. Okay. I respect that. Do you, do you think – I mean, this is – might be a little personal question, but like, do you think your brother's uh, is a, is better than you right now? Mm, yeah, let will see what happens when he gets to college. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, it has the potential to be, for sure. Okay. You know. Yeah. Well, he's a local product, so you know my Eagles. I mean, we're going to be looking at him and and um, get him on the squad. That'd be it should. Yeah, Deuce Staley has uh, you know been a mentor to me, so I'll. Uh, Really? Might needle him when the time comes. Yeah, he's my coach actually. When uh, I was on the Eagles. Wow. Oh yeah, yeah. Did you yet. did you meet? Um, you probably did, but like Brian Westbrook, right? Because he's a he's a villain of a product, correct? Yeah, man. He's uh, he's been a good uh, touch board for me. You know, we we stay in touch every now and then. So. Wow, that's yeah. awesome, man. He he, arguably is, between him and Brian Dawkins, my 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 two favorite Eagles, man. Like, mm-hmm. Those two guys. I don't know, man. Like we. It was at a point, so, like, my I, I fell in football, like, when I – my love for football came when, like, I came back to the States, and um, my mom had gotten, like, East Bay Magazine, right? And because I was looking – I was playing soccer, blah, blah, blah. And on the cover, it had all the Eagles players, right? It had the – all, but it was all black players. I was like, oh, this is cool. McNabb. Yeah. Had Owens. You had Westbrook and Dawkins. I was like, oh, this is cool, man. So, got mad the next day i was like all right eagles is my squad we're playing yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> yeah. that's that's how the love began so he I don't still know. looks like he could play okay. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He's, a, he's a great one but that's mm-hmm. awesome that he's a mentor and um and like you you, you know you kind of keep in contact with him that's, that's that's really awesome that's really cool thank you yeah man how, how did you uh like how did the giants coaching position like come about did you um like, were you th- – before that even happened, before, you, I guess, you were hired, did you think about coaching, like, when you came out of um, college or you just, like, was that something that came out maybe the last few years that you – your passion that you wanted to get into? Yeah, it's an interesting story. Um, so, Pat Shermer was uh, my offensive coordinator when I was playing for the Eagles. Mm-hmm. And uh, we developed a, a relationship, stayed in touch when Chip and the staff got let go in, um, in the lieu of uh, Coach Peterson. Um Coach Shermer ended up in Minnesota. And then when I got let go from the Eagles, I he brought me with him to the Vikings. That's how I got my shot with the Vikings. Mm-hmm. Um, then when I got let go from Minnesota, I was trying to, you know, play to the spring league for a little bit. But I stayed in touch with Coach Shermer that whole time. I was actually trying to play for the Giants. Um, had a workout with them before the 2019, 2018 season. And, um, you know, nothing came of it. But, you know, we stayed in touch. And then literally February of last year when I was trying to get another workout he's like yo i just got an opening on my staff like you thinking about coaching and i was like uh i mean i <laughs> wasn't but <laughs> you know yeah like i always thought of myself as you know i would go back to like seeing old prep and coach but uh, that was something i saw like my 
late thirties, forties or something like that. And, you know, at the time I was working at Merrill Lynch, which is, you know, I studied finance and econ. So it fit with what I studied in school, but you know, football is what lights my soul on fire. So it just made too much sense. I saw it as a way back into the game and um, yeah, man, I, I didn't, didn't look back. So. And what was your, uh, what was the, were you, I, I don't remember your, like the type, like what type of, um, coach were you on the staff like was it uh offensive assistant offensive okay yeah, yeah. so, so in, you... in reality i was a full year intern um the yes yeah. usually don't do that it's usually summer internships but you know it's uh when the head coach is the guy bringing you in i guess you know you can make things out <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah what were some of your uh like i guess like, what was some stuff that you had to work on like as like in that position like over over the last season uh, definitely a deeper understanding of the game. You know, as a running back, I only ever focused on what my position was doing, whereas now I got to kind of look at it from a general bird, bird's eye view and um, understand what the receivers are doing, how that interacts with coverages, and then how coverages can influence your running schemes and, you know, fronts and all that different type of stuff. So, gotcha, gotcha. Nice. Mm-hmm. So, do you think now within your career, like, are you still trained to still? you know, get that opportunity, that shot to play? Or is it also like you're you're also finding that niche within the coaching community and realizing like this could all this is this might just be the second act right now, mm-hmm. essentially. Yeah, man. Um it was definitely an adjustment at first because it was like an ongoing joke in the building, like Saquon and them would be like, nah, Kev's just trying to get back in the NFL. Like, <laughs> 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 yeah. You know, so I definitely had to adjust my mindset. Um, you know, I'm only twenty seven, you know, yeah. for all intents and purposes like could still play right now um yeah but at the same time you know actually before the virus hit i was thinking of uh doing the xfl and kind of preparing for that oh uh, uh, yeah so, yeah crazy. that kind of, yeah so um but no nah, man i think i think you put it perfectly it's like a second act and you know i think it's very obvious when when the work doesn't feel like work i think you're doing what god put you on this earth to do and anything football related doesn't feel like work. So coaching is just as much, just as viable of an avenue for me to pursue my passion. And, you know, me being as young as I am with already having the experience of being in the NFL, uh, I think the sky's the limit. So. Okay. I think for me, based on everything you're saying, like, and you just mentioned like the keyword passion there, like when you, what was your, like, what, what, what are your, what are your true passions? Like say like, um, I guess the, the question might be phrased as like, you went to to Villanova, you got an economics degree, um, mm. you also played football, and now you're mm. a coach. You're like you're in coaching. Like, if you can look at your ultimate view, I feel like football kind of helped you, has given you the opportunity to do certain things like what, like not coaching or just creating this role of recruiting. But like, mm. if, if football was theoretically not in the picture, like what what are your what are your actual passions that you like doing essentially? That's a crazy question. I mean, football's taken up so much of my life that, <laughs> you know, people ask, it's like, what do you mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, like, yeah, if, like, if you didn't play football, what what do you think you'd be, like, do you think you'd still be at Merrill Lynch and, like, being an ad, like, you know, kind of moving up that frame? Or Yeah, most likely. I mean, I was uh, really big on Wall Street um, coming out of college. Uh, that was, like, what I wanted to do. And, you know, whether it's, like, you know, investment banking or whatever the case may be. But, you know, that – that life has a very high burnout rate, you know? Um, so, you know, you make a lot of money, but it's like, for what? You don't even end up enjoying it or anything like that. And, you know, I have friends that, you know, I went to school with that are doing very well for themselves that mm-hmm. either went through that meat grinder for a bit and then, you know, pivoted to other things. Um, so I'd probably be doing that. Um, but my long, long-term goal, you know, I think education, finding some way to give back to the community. And I think that for me, that's through education. Like I, I really enjoy, um, working with kids. I see kids as the next generation, um, of thought leaders in, in society. And I think that's a very, I wouldn't say easy because, you know, they're dealing with their own pain that we, as black people have held on to for generations and you know but i do believe that if we can reach the children and you know get them thinking in a way that is conducive to generational wealth and things of that nature um it'll it'll benefit us as a people you know in the long run so do you did your um your, your your parents i think this is a question like i feel like 
have has did they always give you that belief that like look kevin like it doesn't like we're in this country and you're black but you know what you're not just black you're a human being and you're smart and you're in your and you're in you can they gave you that belief that you could do everything you wanted to right put your mind to it and you could do it right yeah definitely so what do you what do you say to you know i i think i've i've had a lot of issues with this my own self and it, it takes a village to kind of raise, you know, kids and, and, and get them to where they need to be, especially Absolutely. when they look like us. Right. But mm-hmm. I think the more and more I'm understanding the question and, and, and the goal of life, it's like, unfortunately, like we, we, we are going to go through obstacles, but at the same time, like, unfortunately, if some kids, it, it's the circumstances, it seems like it, it is so overwhelming to the point where like it, it then deters them and then they never actually realize a dream, right? So yeah, to your version of coaching and, and wanting to help that younger generation, what is your, what would be your message to kind of be like, hey man, look, you, you might not have a mom, you might not have a dad or your circumstances financially may not be this, but like you can still get to this point, right? You just, it, it just means you're going to have to work that much insanely harder. Right. Like, mm-hmm. But when you get to the, when you get to that mountaintop, even though the mountaintop will always keep moving because it, you never truly reach any destination in life, right? You're always at the level. So mm-hmm. what is your message to them to be like, Hey man, it, it's going to be tough, but don't let it knock you down. Keep finding a way to push it and, and, and be better. Essentially. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, and schools in America, especially, were taught that our history began with slavery, and that is not that could not be further from the truth. You know, um, people, black people, you know, not everyone came from royalty, but there is a, 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 reg- a regalness that is in our blood. There's an excellence that is in the blood of black people, and you know, and I only speak this way because we're, that's what that's who we're talking about. I'm talking to those kids that are dealing with these issues. Um, and I'll just have them know that, you know, the things that they're told about themselves, you, someone's narrative for yourself and for your life does not have to be what you believe about yourself. And, you know, you have every tool internally that you need in order to succeed. And it's the job of those of us, like our age, older, to equip them with the external tools that they need to succeed in the outer world. And, you know, as long as they continue to do the things that they need to do, the big brothers in their life, you know, our, you know, ourselves included, will continue to do the things necessary to give them what they need to do to be successful. And that's one of my missions in life and that I'm trying to, you know, establish myself first to be able to reach back and, you know, lend out a helping hand to, uh, to bring up the next group of guys. And, you know, you just pay it forward, man. That's good. I respect that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah man. So what's your, uh, like, so right now I'd say like, what is your, I guess you, if you could think of like maybe like your next, like either your short-term goal that you're working on right now or like, mm-hmm. the, or like maybe the, the short-term and the long-term if you have like that in your mind. Yeah. So, you know, short-term, um, you know, obviously do this project management thing, um, get rolling with that. Um, you know, just then I would say learning coding, you know, doing different things, uh, kind of laying the foundation, you know, I, I think, you know, um, like I had a pretty bad breakup like not too long ago, and like I, hmm. with that, <laughs> yeah, man, that's cool. <laughs> it, it happened. Bro. Yeah. And I was just thinking to myself, like it, it, it makes you feel rushed. You know, like, like I was rushing my life for in a way that would have me at a place where I could be a certain thing to that person. You know, um, but the the luxury that we are able to afford as men is that you know we have a little bit of a longer runway and. Um, you know, me being 27, there's no reason why I should be trying to live my life as if I'm a 35, 40 year old already, you know, um, not to say that there's not a, uh, an urgency, but you know, that I can do things and still, lay. I'm still in the laying of foundation phase of my life. So, you know, I don't need yeah. to kind of embrace that process and, you know, take full advantage of it. And, you know, uh, the, the things, the bigger ideas that I was talking about, like the longer term goals of, building education pipelines for underprivileged black and brown people. Um, you know, the, the Robert crew at its full scale and, and um, vision that I see it to be. And even, you know, you know, God willing becoming a position coach coordinator or head coach someday in the NFL, that would be, 
those are all things that I'm laying the foundation for right now. And so that's kind of, I think the short term takes care of the long term. And uh, yeah, man, I'm just I'm focused on all that right now. Wow. That's awesome. Thanks, bro. Yeah. The, like the, the project management thing for yourself, like how was that through a certain like university or thing that you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. So the project management Institute is like the gold standard, um, in terms of the industry. Um, so they, they give out certifications. So I just finished up the prerequisite course for that and I'm, uh, currently waiting to get approved to sit for the exam. So should be okay. done with it in the next week. Nice, man. That's awesome. Yeah. Good luck to you on that one. Thanks, bro. No problem. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, we got time. Yeah, it's good that like we're definitely we got some time to do some stuff. I mean, I'm 28. I always like joke around with people. Like I, I always for some reason I always viewed like 30. Um, mm-hmm. or I guess recently like as I've been going through my 20s, I like I'm pretty hard on myself. Sometimes I think like, oh, I should have done this if I if I could have been in this position by that age, then I would have been yeah been a little bit more happier. But like, yeah, at the same time, like you said, um, like we got plenty of time to do stuff. I mean, it doesn't really. Like I, I and, and by the way, I, I see some people that are like getting engaged and married. And I'm like, I don't know if that's gonna work out. <laughs> like I'm like, I, w- I hope for the best. Hope for the best. Like to some people you see, but like there's some I'm like, bro, like all right, like 25. If you want to get married, that's fine. Whatever, you're ready to go. But um, yeah, I'm definitely in the same lane of, as as far as like uh, I guess taking my time and um, mm-hmm. realizing that there's a lot longer to go in terms of like just like. Yeah, like we're not that old. Like, no, I think I just, bro. I think I was like a little bit extra. Uh, I don't know what it was. I was just like, I, I felt time moving and I was like, let me, I, I wish I was at this point at this age, but like at the end of the day, um, like it doesn't matter that much because you can always make a change and like do what you want. Like, Dude, those you know, are like, self imposed uh, yeah. timelines we put on ourselves. So, yeah. 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 Exactly. Like, like, like Frank, like honestly, like, when when we to talk, man, and like I, I've I've seen your journey, bro, and like doing all the things, and you're all but you're always trying, right? You, I don't. <laughs> yeah. you, you may have considered yeah. it as a failure, but like you yeah. you were always trying something new, and then like you <laughs> went to the broadcasting school, and like look at that, right? You graduated and you got the internship, and then we had come up with the idea of like, yo, I, Kevin, I remember I was hounding Frank. I was like, Frank, like yo, we should just podcast. Hey, Frank, like. What are you doing? Let's do this podcast. This podcast. Yeah. Finally, finally, one day, Frank was like, "Yo, let's do this podcast." And <laughs> yeah. can use the Connecticut School of Broadcasting, which sucks that um, their location's not closed. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was a problem. We would have, yeah, we used to have people like we used to have like um, we would have every episode we had, we would do it in a studio, and it was like free for life. So we would have had like mm. if, if everything was normal, we would have had you in there, or we, we had like a few guests. But yeah, it just happened to be that they just like recently we're like yeah like I, and the email was funny it was like from the the head of the place he was like yeah guys um just want to let you know uh, the family that owns the school can't really handle the pay for it or whatever and like good luck or everything i was like <laughs> wow. i was like all right well so at least we have this so we that's why let, let, that's what led us to getting like these microphones led us to having people on skype and then just reaching right. out um ourselves like i sent like i tell julius all the time like i'll send like cert like probably like 20 30 dms like per week just trying mm-hmm. like slowly um build and like and just have uh and have guests that we respect and like and respect their journeys and everything because at, at this point we just love to have like great conversations and we like to learn anything we can learn and like that's and we love to talk and that's why we uh got into it at the end of the day because um if we could turn this into uh a job instead of just like our side passion like that's yeah that's something like the ultimate goal so and this is where it starts bro that's where it yeah. starts exactly yeah but no i mean I've, I've had a lot of fun doing this podcast um just hearing different stories listening to different things but at the same time it gives me the ability because i like to like do my own research on things that i'm interested in mm. so when frank was like yo yeah kevin i'm gonna come on like dude i went on google and i was like oh who is this guy all right let's go yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's go i, yeah. I research man so i'm i don't know that to me is exciting right and yeah. maybe the goal is to tell younger kids like say i think my my thing is that i'm learning is like your your passions are always going to change and i'm yeah. learning that like you, you do need to follow the things that you feel good doing right because that, that mm-hmm. leads to other things and i think I've, mm-hmm. I've always in my life like i've been like to frank's point like i went to school and like i i went but i graduated later right because i was i thought i was supposed to go to, like this big school long story short is 
I was supposed to go to St. John's and then got hit with like a $60,000 bill. I was like, yeah, I can't afford that. Mm -hmm. I pivoted last second. Hey, let me go to Bloomfield College for a year and kind of lay that foundation down. Um, I got into that mode where like, I think uh, being young, I wasn't truly ready for college right right then. I, I... needed to kind of grow up a little bit. So my first, few, my first few semesters were rough and I withdrew and took a year and a half off and then spoke to some people. Um, and then I realized, you know what, like my goal for going to college is like, I need wanting to go for myself too. I need to find out what I want to do and truly like work hard at it. Yeah. And I went back and, you know, I graduated later than some of my, my counterparts, you know, but um, <clears throat> I think for me personally, it's just, I no longer look at it as, a negative, right? I look at it as like, it was my own journey, right? Because Mm -hmm. my year and a half off, I I did so much within that year and a half, like get an internship and, and just learning more about myself that helped me to understand, like when I go back to school, I need to strategize. I need to take it semester by semester. And ultimately I graduated and I have my degree and it, that, that I'm so proud of that accomplishment that I hope kids truly understand that like like frank says it's, it's about the journey and you can't you even yeah. said it like don't put that self-imposed timeline on yourself mm-hmm. like that's it's like a mental prison right you see the every fastest day. way to happen it is right mm-hmm. and and linkedin honestly man like i've i used to be like i used to go on linkedin and then you know when you get that message it's like oh like oh your, your boy oh he's now executive blah blah and you're like oh what am I doing? Like, <laughs> why am I doing <laughs> like, yeah. I, I like your, I like your, 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 your new job title. But deep down, I feel like the self-loathing to my own self. Like, damn. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah, man. We need to like remove that mental, like mentality from ourselves, especially when, from you know the black community. Like, and, and truly, just we're, we're not in competition with life and everyone else. Like, we're in competition with our own selves. selves. Yeah. And we just need to focus on our own self, put that blinder on, just, just go. And it's, it's, it sounds easy when I say it, but there are just times I'm like, I'm, I'm like the guy in the race, like looking all around. Like, yeah, you're a bro. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> but yeah. um, no, man, just so to pivot back into our discussions, like what are, what, how are you, your brother now has you as, a resource as someone who has been through all phases of pretty much everything that he's about to kind of go through. Yeah. What, are, what is your goal now being his mentor? Like, what are you going to do for Like, what, what's your goal for him? Like while he's in college, like, you can be like, you're going to create a schedule for him or, or have him be more resourceful and check it with you. And then, and hopefully ask you the questions that like you think you would hope you could have asked when you were at his age. Yeah, well, you know, you got to do it within personality, right? Like, he's definitely a more private person. And, you know, I'm happy-go-lucky, open, you know. Um, so it's probably take a little bit more prying on my mm-hmm. part. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's more just having him not go through some, some of the pain I had to go through through my own pig-headedness and, you know, just yeah. young stubbornness, you know. Um, but, yeah, man, it's just – because there's a lot of things you can avoid. And, you know, you I, for me, it's about – getting the most optimal outcome of all possible outcomes, right? So like for me, for looking at his life, I'm like, graduate in three years if you can. Set yourself up to leave school after your third year to enter the draft and, you know, take it from there, bro. You know, it's uh, it sounds like a lot, but, you know, like it's always, I was always taught, you know, begin with the end in mind and just break it up into smaller steps from there, you know? So for him, like I, I could have graduated in three years, but, you know, I was – um, and partying and kissing girls and got mono. So. <laughs> 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 Sam Darnold before Sam Darnold. <laughs> yeah, literally. literally. So, you know, that messed up my, fresh, my freshman year semester um, academic flow, but yeah, they worked out, man. Yeah, but you know, to see you didn't know that I didn't know those things. I didn't know that you could uh, just do a normal course look because we were taking summer classes. Um, you know, mandatory because of football. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you could have loaded up on those and ended up finishing a lot earlier, you know. So just having, imparting wisdom like that, you know, but also you, you want to enjoy this this time. But, I mean, dude, three, four years, it's it's like that. And then you got yeah. the rest of your life. So, you know, enjoy, but within moderation. I actually like what you just said there. The um, Since it, I think for, especially for top prospects, right? Like if you're, if you know you're going to be first, second, third, fourth round picks, like, to your point, like 
you you could graduate in three years if you loaded up on summer classes and doing stuff mm-hmm. like that, right? So in actuality, like you could still leave school with a degree and potentially be in the NFL as well. So I think that's exactly. actually a good a good thing. But do you think that I know college is like a lot of the majors um like I guess conflict with your schedule of football, right? So that might mm-hmm. hinder you on what major you, you, you can pick. Do you think there needs to be a better um how do I phrase it? A better way to like make sure kids or or not just athletes first, but they're 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 students and then they're athletes, right? Because it, one they should they should both yes coincide together, but it should feel like okay if you come to our school, like we do value education, and not all schools are going to be like Van, um, uh, Vanderbilt. Oh, Bill, Bill and Bill. They weren't they weren't really bad either. Though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's they, a good school. That's a really good school too. Yeah. It is a good school, but like some schools, like like those blue, like those schools, like Duke or 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 Stanford or Harvard, like they do, you know, like in your school, like they value education, maybe a little like more than sports, and then sports is like second nature, right? So, I think they need to kind of maybe encompass more of that belief, essentially, so that kids are able to then pick a major that they do believe will help them in the future. Like, Absolutely. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. You know, certain majors, like I remember even at NOVA, like the engineering majors, like they'd have to leave practice early sometimes. And, you know, coaches didn't really want they, – they'd be like, okay, but they didn't like it, you know. <laughs> mm, yeah. So it, um, there's a fine line you got to walk. Yeah, man. I just say I think it's a case by case basis. But in a perfect world, yeah, there it would be uh, more avenues to allow kids to chase those engineering and you know what other what whatever other uh, tracks they might want to pursue. Okay, no, yeah. that's good. Where I'm, I'm guessing you're. I mean, you had to full the full ride, but was that did that also cover for like the summer, like when you took your, like your summer courses and stuff like that? Yeah, everything was paid for. Okay, nice. That's, that's awesome, man. Oof, yeah. That's good. Yeah. You, you probably know um i'm blanking on his, his last name right now um he's from montclair and i know he a few montclair guys played football at, at, at shane Joe. harris there you go shane harris i think yeah, Jimmy pitts i believe Jimmy pitts, yeah we had a couple guys yeah man. wow man that's that's crazy it is a small world mm-hmm. yeah. yeah wow that's awesome yeah man it was a good time <sighs> yeah do you oh yeah right, sorry no you no you go ahead do you do you do you like would you, if you say now would you would you say you prefer like not prefer but like if you could go back right now would you mm-hmm. go back to like freshman year of college and doing that whole track being the big man on campus or do you prefer like your rookie your rookie year of in the NFL? I uh, rookie in the NFL. Money was a lot better. <laughs> 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 yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, man. oh my gosh. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, man, this has been uh, an awesome uh, time. And I, I really, I wanted to thank you for, uh, for coming on with us today. Um, Cause obviously That's like, cool. it's, it's such a, like, it's like, I always talk to Julius about this. Um, it's weird because like, we're so young in our uh, podcast careers that like, we it's like hard for us to like like thank you enough because you like it's like um because of like your because who you are like it kind of like elevates our episode a little bit and i wish that we could like thank you enough to get i mean if you're interested in nick's tickets by the way like when this (laughs) blows over like i will like i will message you and just give you like whatever game you want for next season if they get that season back yeah like anyway and and like if we can do anything to like elevate your brand in any way that's what thank we you, man. Love to do because like it's hard for us to even put into words to thank somebody um, yeah. that just has like uh, that's just well known and like has um, a big network that we're like striving to get to. So I just wanted to like put that out there. Oh, I wanted to thank you for even coming on with us in the first place. I will take you up on those next tickets. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, Knicks or like it might be like Yankees or something. So either way, yeah. I'll be hitting you up at some point, or you just hit me up. You can hit yeah. me up whenever, and uh, I will make sure we can get we can make that happen. I appreciate you guys, man. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. I think my mom is going to be very. She's she's, she's going to be very happy when I, when I tell her like the, the you know the level of guests that we had on one because you're you know like the family back the family background and everything. She's going to be very excited about that. She's 
she's wanted us to diversify our, our podcast for a very long time. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I'm, I, I'm glad to make her happy, man. <laughs> uh, I, but no, to, to, to Frank's point, like we, we are truly, you know, happy that you, you know, took the time out of your busy schedule to kind of come on and, and just give us, you know, insights into just different things from, from collegiate sports to professional sports to, you know, being a CEO and founder and, and just being educated black man who, you know, who's here to make a, a big difference, right? And, and seeing the, the bigger goals in, in, in life. But to Frank, to your point, anything that we could do to help in my own self. So, I mean, off wax, you know, you can take down my contact info and mm-hmm. let me know when you're having like leadership stuff that, you know, I can kind of be a part of as well. I, I'm, I think I, I want to do more in my community. And um, mm-hmm. I think you already have like a certain type of platform and I would love to kind of join in, but anything yeah. that I can yeah. do, Frank can do, um, I would love to help and, 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 and I'm happy to be a part of it. Thank you guys. I really appreciate that. Thank you, brother. Hey guys, no once again, this is uh, episode 11, uh, Kevin Benungai, Um, and we'll see you guys uh, next week. Thank you guys. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin, man. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. All right, guys. Later. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Kevin, you too. All right. Later.